Welcome learners to NIO studio. I'm Dr. Priya and I'm going to teach you today accounting ratios part 3. We have already covered two sessions on accounting ratios. Learners, you have understood that ratio analysis is very very important to make our financial statements understandable, intelligible to our internal and external users of these financial statements. So, Today, we will talk about the equity ratios. Equity or turnover ratios help us to determine how effectively we are utilizing the resources of a firm. It tells us the velocity or the speed at which assets are converted into a sales or revenue from operations. The faster, the better for the firm because it shows that there is effective utilization of the resources of our firm. The resources are the current assets and the fixed assets of a firm. It is always expressed as times and always a ratio more than one is always better and appreciable by the firm. Some of the important activity ratios which we are going to study today is inventory turnover ratio better known as stock turnover ratio, trade receivable turnover ratio, also called debtors turnover ratio, trade payables turnover ratio or the creditors turnover ratio and lastly we will learn today working capital turnover ratio. Now let us take up the first equity ratio, inventory turnover ratio. It is most popularly called stock turnover ratio. It will show us the relationship between the cost of goods sold and average stock. Average stock means closing and opening stock divided by 2. This ratio will tell us the number of times stock flows or rotates in an accounting period to generate sales and therefore the faster the stock gets converted into sales the faster the ratio will increase and therefore stock turnover ratio is very very important. It is also expressed as a rate. Now let us look at the formula cost of goods sold or revenue from operations. We can take cost of revenue from operations or we can take revenue from operations if we are not given the cost of revenue from operations which is nothing but the cost of goods sold. Cost of goods sold can also be calculated by deducting from sales across profit. Average stock, if no opening stock is given, students, please be careful. You will just take the closing stock as average stock. And if cost of revenue from operations is not given, do not worry. Take the revenue from operations as the numerator. Next activity ratio is trade receivable turnover ratio or the debtors turnover ratio. It is a direct reflection of the collection period for the debtors to pay us for the credit sales we have done. It is also an indicator of a credit policy extended for our debtors. Therefore, this ratio will show the relationship between credit sales and average trade debtors. Average trade debtors are those who have purchased our goods on credit. And therefore, this ratio is also known as accounts receivable turnover ratio. Net credit sales is the numerator which means net credit sales is nothing but credit sales less sales returns which may be in the form of credit. Average debtors or our accounts receivable is the de denominator of this particular formula. Average trade receivable turnover ratio, it is opening stock plus closing debtors plus bills receivable divided by 2. As you have seen in the formula, we are taking into consideration both the opening and closing debtors and also 
the opening and closing bills receivable and then finding out the average by dividing it by 2. If opening paid receivables are not given, then closing paid receivables are taken as the average paid receivables. Again, the efficiency at which the receivables are received will tell us the efficiency of our policies towards our debtors. It will tell us how efficiently the debtors are paying us the amount due to them. If it is a high ratio, it indicates the shorter collection period, which means the debtors are promptly paying us for their credit purchases. If it is a high ratio, it also tells us that we are following a maybe a restrictive credit policy. Our credit policy is restricted to our selected debtors, purchase, purchasers, or we have we may tend to lose sales in the long run and lose on profitability if we do not expand and have a liberal credit policy in the long run. A low ratio, however, indicates a longer collection period, which implies delayed payment by debtors, which means that it is a signal, it is a warning signal that we may incur bad debts. They may not pay us at all, and there may be a high burden of high interest costs for maintaining those debtors because we have blocked our working capital in terms of having a liberal credit policy which has increased our credit purchases. So, so we need to borrow in the short term also to keep our operations in line. Now let us look at the calculation of debtors turnover ratio. Now in this illustration, there is one year given, the year of 2016. It starts from the 1st April 2016 and ends on 31st March 2017. This is the accounting period 16, 2016, 17, which we have taken into consideration in this illustration. Sundry debtors are given as 20,000. That means it is the opening. And in the year 2017, on 31st March, it is 45,000 for sundry debtors. So, also the figures for the bills receivable provision for doubtful debtors, both for 1st April 2016 and 31st March 2017 are given. Some additional information is given also for 2016-17. The total sales have been 2,10,000. The sales returns have been 10,000. The cash sales have been 50,000. Learners, now we have to be very careful when we use this information for calculation of our trade receivable or our debtors turnover ratio. We have not to include cash sales. We have not to include provision for doubtful debts. Let us look at that. Net credit sales is equal to total sales minus sales returns plus, plus cash sales, which is 2,10,000 credits total sales minus your sales return 10,000 minus your cash sales 50,000 that makes it 1,50,000. So, 1,50,000 is your net credit sales, whereas your average trade receivables are only 50,000. And therefore, the turnover ratio of trade receivables or debtors turnover ratio comes out to be three times, which is moderately good for the firm. It means that the debtors are paying us promptly and it is three times of the sales that are made on the credit basis. Trade payables turnover ratio is also called the creditors turnover ratio. This ratio will tell us how promptly we make payments to our creditors. The suppliers learners are always interested to find out how the firm is going to make payments and when it is going to make payments. The faster it does, the better it is for. And therefore, the numerator of this ratio is net credit purchases and the denominator is average trade payables. In the net credit purchases, you will take the total purchases, deduct the cash purchases and deduct the credit returns 
purchases and therefore you will also look at the denominator which will be nothing but the opening plus closing creditors plus opening and closing bills payable divided by 2. Let us look at the illustration which I am showing you on the slide. Here 2016-17 extract from the income statements have been given. On 1st April 2016 our creditors are 15,000. On 31st March 2017 our Sun creditors are 45,000. The bills payable are 5,000 on 1st April 2016 whereas on 31st March 2017 it is 15,000, a tremendous increase in a bills payable three times. Reserve for discount on creditors is 1,500 on 1st April 2016 whereas on 31st March 2017 it is 4,500. Some additional information is also given to us in terms of the period 2016-17. Total purchases made by us have been 2,10,000 as a firm. The purchase returns which we have done as a firm to our suppliers is rupees 10,000 and cash purchases, purchases for which we have already paid in terms of cash is 40,000. Now, Again, for calculations we have to be a bit careful, learners, we will not take into consideration reserve for discount on creditors, we will also not take into consideration cash purchases. In fact, we will deduct from total purchases the cash purchases and also we will deduct the purchase returns. So therefore, let us look at the solution of this illustration, net purchases is therefore Net credit purchases is therefore equal to total purchases minus your purchase returns minus your cash purchases, which means 2 lakh 10,000 minus 10,000 minus 40,000 is equal to 1 lakh 60,000. Your average trade payables are therefore equal to only 50,000, and therefore your trade payables turn up per ratio will become 1,60,000 divided by 40,000 which comes to 4 times which means your payments are 4 times and therefore it is moderately high again and it is a good indicator for creditors to keep on giving you their supplies on credit basis. But you need to see that you maintain this or Slightly you if need arises you may also increase it for keeping a good working capital for your operations to increase your profitability in future. A supplier therefore is always looking at the speed with which they are being paid off on an average during the year. It effectively tells them that they are, their payments are secure and you will pay them on time. Now the next activity ratio is working capital turnover ratio. Working capital is current assets less your current liabilities. What are your current assets? Current assets are debtors, bills receivable, cash, inventories. Any change in them will have an impact on your revenue from operations. What are your current liabilities? Your bills payable, your Creditors, your overdrafts again will have an impact on your revenue from operations. So working capital turnover ratio will indicate the speed at which the working capital is utilized, the resources are utilized to meet your business operation requirements. It indicates the number of times the working capital is utilized in the course of a year to generate the revenue from operations. Higher ratio, better ratio, more efficient is the firm, more number of times the working capital in a year is used to turn around the resources into sales. A lower ratio is an indicator that your efficiency of utilizing your working capital is coming down and therefore needs to be improved upon, needs to be looked at 
again. Therefore, the formula for calculation of working capital turnover ratio is cost of revenue from operations divided by average working capital. Learners, again be careful if cost of revenue from operations is not given, cost of goods sold is not given, do not worry. Just take the revenue from operations as the numerator. If the opening working capital is not given, then take the closing working capital at the end of the year for the denominator. Look at this example. Capital employed is given as 6 lakhs. Net fixed assets is given as 3 lakhs. Cost of goods sold is given as 21 lakh. And gross profit is given as 3 lakh. Capital employed is given, as I said, as 6 lakhs. Your net fixed assets is given as 4 lakhs and therefore the working capital becomes 2 lakh. Whereas your net sales is COGS plus your gross profit which is 21 lakhs plus 3 lakhs which comes to 24 lakhs. So now net sales divided by your average working capital 24 lakhs divided by 2 lakhs gives you a 12 times turnover of working capital in a year to generate your sales which is also good for a firm. A firm which is aiming to earn higher margin of profit, higher mar margin of utilization of resources in the coming years. So today learners we have completed the sessions on ratios, accounting ratios namely the solvency ratios, the liquidity ratios, the profitability ratios and the activity ratios. We have learned how to calculate all these ratios keeping in mind that we are making our financial statements understandable for our internal and external stakeholders. We are calculating the amounts, the figures in financial statements, but we are not making them understandable. We are not helping our management if we are not doing ratio analysis. Ratio analysis is a tool of understanding how the financial statements can be used for better policy prescriptions for the future. We need to make these quantitative figures on financial statements more measurable more understandable, more comprehensible for our management and that is why we have done a ratio analysis and now we are able to make policy prescriptions for the future as board of directors as we can use them for our decisions for investments, we can use them for making decisions of funding, investment for making our forecasts for the future, for making policy prescriptions for correction of variances in the various operations of our firm. And therefore, we can say in a nutshell that the ratio analysis can be used for making analysis a study of the financial statements, making them understandable, simplifying quantitative figures mentioned on those financial statements. They can be used for forecast and predictions for the future. They can be used for correction of errors and variances, deviations if any in our financial statements over the years and it will help us to even understand the trend of our financial statements over the years or to make comparison with other firms in the industry. However, learners, we need to understand there are certain limitations of accounting ratios. It is just one of the tools of analysis of financial statements. We can use this tool along with some other tool to make our assessment, to make our analysis more accurate. So we need to understand that accounting ratio analysis is not free from weaknesses. First of all, it ignores the qualitative aspect. It is only based on quantitative, on numbers. We have not looked at the quality of products. We have not looked at the quality of services. We have not looked at the 
quality of the welfare measures done by a firm. We have not looked at the corporate responsibility of the business firm. So we are only talking of numbers and numbers here. And we are only analyzing numbers mentioned on financial statements to study the financial statements. Second, it ignores price level changes. We have not spoken of price level changes. We have not spoken of inflationary rise or fall in the price level, in the commodity price index. So we are just talking in terms of absolute numbers. So to make them more realistic, they must be pegged to some inflation factor. Third, no single concept. Some firms may use gross profit, some firm may use net profit to show, to study their profitability. Some may use net profit before tax, some may use net profit after tax. Some may use a different policy for depreciation, written down value method, some may use some other method like straight line method. So the, there is no single concept, no uniformity as to the adoption of policies which have resulted in these figures on a financial statement. Sometimes the results may be too misleading because there has been window dressing, which means the data is not yet reliable. There is some bias involved in the collection of the data of the firm. Then finally, there is no single standard ratio for comparison. How do we compare intra-firm, inter-firm over the years? Maybe over the years, maybe more accurate when you talk of standards because you may be using the same ratios for comparison. But when we are talking of intra-firm or intra-industry, we fail to make, come to a correct comparison which is indicative of the changes, the dynamic changes that are going on in the industry or within industry because the product it line itself, the sort of services offered by the industry keep on changing. Conditions are too dynamic today. There are difficulties in forecasting. We are talking of past results in financial statements, but conditions as I said is uncertain, dynamic, very, very fast changing with the changing changes in business conditions and therefore it is very difficult to predict with accuracy the conditions that are going to prevail in future. So ratios can go and give us only approximate results. They cannot give us the accurate results as to what will happen in the future. And therefore, this is a great limitation of calculation of our accounting ratios. So let us do a recap learners today of the accounting ratios as are all our three sessions of the accounting ratios are now over and you have learned liquidity ratios which exactly told us which indicated to us the capacity of the firm to repay short term liabilities are current liabilities. How far the firm is capable of meeting its short term commitments. We spoke of activity or turnover ratios also which showed us how effectively the firm is using its resources for its operations. Then the solvency ratios measured the ability of the business firm to meet its long term commitments to its various lenders. Finally, we spoke of profitability ratios which help us to assess the overall effectiveness and profitability of the business concern in terms of the cost of goods sold, the operating expenses, the non-operating expenses and indicated how much is left with the firm to retain as reserves or to distribute as dividends to the proprietors. So learners, we have come to the end of this session and see you in the next session with some more inputs on accountancy. Thank you learners. Happy learning.